Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a few minutes. I just want to make sure everybody has enough time to go ahead and get logged in. So if you'd like to grab that first or second cup of coffee, feel free to do so. Hey folks, still see a couple people dropping in, so I'm gonna give folks about one or two more minutes and then we'll go ahead and start, uh, excuse me, then we'll go ahead and get started. Alrighty, well, we're at the five minute mark, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining today. My name is Shannon. I run the customer education here at Concord. Really excited to be working with all of you today. So this is the Concord 101 class, it's usually about two hours, maybe a little bit longer. We have a pretty big class today, which is great. So we might get some additional questions and such. Uh, this class is being recorded, so you will receive an email with a link to a Concord 101 recording if you do want to review this session later on down the line, or if you want to share it with your colleagues, that's absolutely fine as well. So before we get started, one thing I just want to ask, and you can just put this information in the chat box, is one, how are you all doing today? Happy Thursday. And two, how long have you been using Concord for? Wow. 
All right, great. Well, kind of a mixed bag of experience here, but that's fantastic. We got some people who've been using it for over a year and some newbies. That's fantastic. So if you've been using it for a while, definitely jump in with any tips and tricks you've picked up along the way. Uh, and I did see a question in the chat, so I just want to remind folks that this class is being recorded, uh, so you will have the opportunity to watch it again if you would like to, if you want to share it out with your colleagues, that's fine too. Well, perfect. I have one final thing that I would like to give you before we kind of get started here. Um, and it's just a, a resource guide. So you don't have to keep it open today. You don't have to use it today. But essentially what it's going to do is after you log off, if you want kind of a quick resource to be able to go through everything that we have talked about today, uh, and you don't really want to watch a, a long recording, this will be very helpful. So let me go ahead and pull that up for you. Give me one second, and then I'm just going to drop it into the chat box. I'll also be including this in the email that gets sent out. So if for whatever reason you misplaced it on your desktop, you'll still have access to it. But let me share my screen so you can just kind of see what I'm talking about here. So it's really just a couple of pages of information, important links to help you through, goes over everything that we have talked about here. And then after the session today, if you want to practice or just kind of play around in the platform, you know, take action on everything that we've talked about, there's some action items or activities, whatever you want to call it, that you can practice with. So that way, if you do want to test out your knowledge, this is a great option. So I'm going to put this into the chat box here. It's yours to keep, yours to share out to your team if you would like to. But just nice to have on hand. We do have our help center, of course, where we have just tons of information as well. But this is a little bit more compact and you don't have to search for it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. So contract life cycle, this is what we're going to be talking about essentially, but a lot more in depth. So what life cycle stages can we use Concord to combat? Drafting. We can build within Concord internal approval. We can make sure that all of the appropriate executives, managers, team members that need to uh, you know, sign off on a document have the opportunity to do so. We can negotiate the contract dynamically with our colleagues and with third parties who have been invited. We can sign the contract. Our e-signature process is legally binding. We can securely store the contract. We have an unlimited repository. So you can store as many contracts as you would like. And then we also have the opportunity to report and analyze off of all of the data that we have incorporated into Concord. So when we say that Concord is a CLM, we really mean it. You can take the contract from start to finish. Its entire life cycle is able to be managed directly within the platform, which is great for you because it means you don't have to hop around between multiple different platforms to get the job done. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Today, we're gonna to be talking about users and teams. Do I have any admins in this session today? Wonderful. So a lot of this functionality is admin managed, but if you are not an admin, do not worry because it is still going to be a function of the platform that you need to be comfortable with. So I will certainly make the distinction between what admins manage and what non admins use, but I just want to let everybody know that everything we talk about today is going to be applicable to every user within your Concord account. 
We're also going to talk about folders and sharing, so managing our access and compliance of our documents, creating documents from scratch, collaborating on documents, and our approval workflows. And we'll close out with e-signature. So again, I really like to stress, especially if you're pretty new to Concord, that our e-signature is legally binding. A lot of folks are not familiar with that fact um, and are concerned that they're going to be able to draft their contracts out in Concord, but then they're going to have to bring it to another platform in order to actually execute the agreement fully. So we actually do it all. So we're going to go through that process as well. And one thing I always like to mention is I keep the chat box open here on just a completely separate screen. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. We have a pretty big session today, so I'm going to unmute or allow everyone to talk. Um, so if you feel comfortable jumping in audibly, you are more than welcome to. Um, otherwise, use the chat. I keep it open. I answer those questions as they come through, but I just like to give people the option because sometimes questions can be a little bit tricky to articulate through the chat box. I myself have tried before and failed miserably. So whatever works best for you. So I'm just going through and giving everybody permission to talk now. Again, you don't have to, it's not a requirement. Um, additionally, you're muted by default. So you just have to unmute yourself to, uh, to chat. So really quickly, just gonna cover the account types, not because I'm touting one over the other, uh, but because the different account types are just going to give you different functionality. So I will, of course, call out what functionality comes with Pro, what comes with Enterprise. But I just like to mention that there are different tiers, again, not to push one on you or, you know, convince you of another one. But I'm using the Enterprise account, so my UI just might look a little bit different than yours. Now, what's really important for all of us here is going to be the different permissions. So these are our standard permissions. We have viewers who can view documents, pretty self-explanatory there. We have collaborators who have the opportunity to request edits from third parties. They can fill in specific fields and they can invite other individuals to the documents. And then we have creators. So that's where I assume a lot of you are at if you're not an admin, but you're gonna be able to build documents, edit documents, sign documents, share documents, really take that start to finish approach with your contracts. Now, these again are just standard user types. So I like to go over them right out front. So we kind of have a better idea of what we're getting into as we start this process. But I do want you to know that if these don't seem like they're gonna fit your needs right away, we do have a lot of other flexible options to make sure that the folks that you invite into Concord are going to be able to do exactly what you need them to do. Now, I know a lot of you had mentioned that you are admins. So what makes an admin an admin is they get to also manage company settings. So you get to set up single sign-on as an admin, security preferences, mandatory tagging. But one of the functionalities that I like to call out is this thing called admin access. You might hear it referred to also as admin oversight. Because although this is restricted to admins, it does affect all of us. Because admins do have the permission to view all documents. So what that means is if I create a document and I share it out to one of my customers, it's a sales agreement, my admin can come in and view that document even if I don't invite them to do so. So not that anybody would be drafting any documents that they don't want their admins to see, but it's just something to be very mindful about. If you are creating very private documents because you are in HR, and maybe your admins are not in HR, so you don't want them to see that information. I'll give you a quick little demo of admin access because it is certainly something that you wanna talk about as a team, if you want that enabled or if you don't want it enabled. All right, so let's hop over into the platform. I try not to bore folks too much with slides. And I'm just gonna to come to my homepage here and we're gonna quickly just go through the UI. For those of you that have logged in, it's Pretty straightforward, but just a couple of quick things to get us acquainted. So we have our search bar up at the top right here. This is a keyword search. I'm just gonna type in NDA. Now it's gonna look through three specific locations in the document. 
So I like to make this call out so that way when you are drafting your documents, you know where information is going to be pulled from when your team runs searches. It's going to be pulled from the title of the document. It's going to be pulled from the body of the document. And it's going to be pulled from the third party field within the contract summary. So I will call those locations out when we get into the document, but it's important to know where that information is searchable. You can also search for documents by the keyword you type in, the stage of the document, any tags that are associated with the document. And of course, if you want to just change your keywords, you have the opportunity to do that as well. Now I'm just going to return home. Our front lines icons here really just allow us to start the document from scratch. We can create templates. We can store previously signed documents. We can draft and sign. This is going to bring us to the same place here, this new document button. It's just a great way to get started if you're new to the platform. So if you're not sure where to start, you can hit that new document button and it'll essentially take you to a, a more in-depth document builder. So great for new users. Now, our left-hand navigation panel is where we're gonna spend a little bit of time today. I wanna to talk about our documents page. The UI probably looks pretty familiar to all of you. It was built out to look very similar to an inbox of email. So if you use Google, Gmail, I don't know why I was gonna call it Google Mail. I don't think I've said that in years. <laughs> or Microsoft Outlook, we have kind of our inbox options followed by all of our incoming emails, or in this case, all of our contracts. So that is intentional. We want the UI to feel very familiar to new users. So your inbox is essentially all of your documents. Every document that you have shared, every document that you have created, every document that you have been shared to, it's all gonna exist right here. So one mention is that I use this demo account fairly regularly, so I clean it up very, very often. You will probably see a lot more documents than I have here. Also, it will probably look a lot more organized as well. But we also can filter through by stages. So if you want to see things in the template and review that have been canceled, you certainly can. Your personal folder is where all of your documents are stored that don't exist in a shared folder. And then we have our shared folders here. Now I'm gonna come back to shared folders because there are a couple of things that you just wanna keep in mind when you use shared folders, but this is where you can access shared folders that you have been invited to and where you can see what documents exist in those folders. But again, we are gonna come back to that in just a little bit. One final thing that I'd like to call out here is when you are in your inbox, you're going to have a couple of options when you highlight information. So you can take actions such as copy, excuse me, copy as a template, export the list, download the documents. You can move them into a different folder. You can archive documents. What does that mean? It essentially is the same functionality of archiving an email. The email is still active. The document will still be active. It won't cancel the document. It won't archive the document for anybody else that is shared to the document, just keeps it out of sight, out of mind. So if you want a very clean inbox, maybe where you're only seeing contracts that are applicable to you over the next three months, you can archive your documents. You will still be able to search for them. They will still be active. If there are any deadline notifications associated with those documents, you are still going to receive all of that information. It's really just kept in a different location so you don't have to look at it. But if you wanna see all of those documents, you're just gonna select the show archived under the filter in the top left, and all of those archived documents are gonna appear for you. So you can see my visual here went from 95 to 116. So I had quite a few archived myself. One final thing, I know this isn't the most exciting information, but there is a lot that you can do with it. If you do attach a filter to your document. So let's say I wanna see everything that has been signed. You can export this information. Now it's going to be a line item export but you can run an advanced export. And I just wanna show you how much information is contained in these exports because it can essentially function as a report. So I'm sure a lot of you have stakeholders in a lot of these contracts that are very concerned about the sign date, very concerned about 
getting that document executed, but they might not be in Concord themselves. You might not have invited them to the document. They might not be a user within Concord, but you wanna give them a lot of information without having to use a paid seat within Concord. This is a great way to do that. So let me download this. Should take only a couple seconds here and then let's pull it up so we can take a look. So I exported the list and you can see it gives us a lot of detail. It tells who it was shared with, the company, the document title, if there was any descriptions or tags associated with it, that would be downloaded as well. The signature date, the duration of the contract, renewal information. So great for awareness to colleagues outside of Concord. Also, if you use any sort of grid-based platform for project management, this would be very easily uploaded into Excel. It's an Excel document or any other sort of platform that you use for managing line item based information. So definitely a unique tool. You can use it for reporting. You can use it for exporting, importing into all the other platforms that you take advantage of. Excellent. All right, let's return home. Deadlines. This is where all of your date based information is going to be shown to you. So I don't have too much. You can tell a lot of things are coming up fairly quickly. We have a monthly payment clause that is gonna be due in July, sales agreements, monthly payment clause. So this is a recurring deadline. So I'll show you how to set these up, but it's really great to be able to have this information all out front as soon as I log in. Because a lot of you are probably managing a very high number of contracts and manually keeping track of all of those deadlines and all of that information is probably very hard, very painful to do. So as long as you input date based information, Concord is going to take care of that for you. Activity. Just all of the recent activity that has taken place. So I did quite a bit of work on Tuesday and Friday. You can see all of the people that I have invited to the documents when they read the document, when they had been invited. And just a great overview of actions that have been taken to all of the documents that you have awareness on. We're going to come back to all of this here. But what I'm going to scroll down to now is our settings. So every user within Concord has personal settings admins have access to company settings. So we're going to talk about personal settings today. But if we do have any admins in the class, I have a lot of great resources for you for admin based information. I run a weekly, almost weekly, sometimes bi-weekly admin course and send you a recording of that. And I'm happy to stay on and answer any questions you have at the end of the session if there's something that was sticking out to you that you want answered. But everybody is going to have access to these personal information, my details, companies, custom messages. So your details are where you can add a photo, you can add your job title, you can add your phone number. Companies are any companies that you are associated with for your organization's account. So this is an enterprise functionality referred to as subsidiary management. So essentially, I'm sure all of you are familiar with a subsidiary company, but if your company A is also in charge of company B, C, and D. What Concord allows you to do is keep those companies separate, even though they all fall under the umbrella of company A, because your legally binding documents for company B need to be separated from company C and company D. So Concord allows you to do that. So if you are on the legal team, or if you are an executive assistant to the CEO, you're going to need to be involved in multiple different companies. So your admin can share you out to multiple different companies. What's great about this is it doesn't cost anything extra. So if you are involved in five subsidiaries, you're still only using one account. But this is where you're able to identify what companies you are involved in, as well as the role that you have. So if you're new and when I asked, hey, are you an admin? And you thought, I'm not sure. This is where you're able to find out what capabilities you have. So for Acme Global Company, I'm an admin. For the Phoenix organization, that's where we're working today, I'm an admin. And for one of my colleagues, uh, her companies, I am an admin as well. So we use a lot of demo accounts here at Concord, as you can tell. Now this here is probably one of my favorite features. It's not super glamorous, but let me explain to you why it is my favorite. You are probably all involved in many, many platforms. And all of those platforms send you emails, they send you notifications, they send you alerts. And it's a very easy in this day and age to suffer from alert fatigue. 
So when you are sending invitations to third parties or customers, we don't want it to look like it's just another alert or notification from one of the platforms they use. So what this allows us to do is create templated messages. So that way our customers feel as if they are getting a very personalized direct call to action. And one thing that I have realized, I worked for many, many collaborative SaaS platforms that if you give somebody a call to action, they're a lot more likely to do what it is they need you to do without having to set up a meeting or a phone call. So it's a big time saver too. So let's say that I send out just a lot of NDAs on a regular basis. Rather than typing out a custom message for NDAs, I created a template. So essentially it says, hey, sign the NDA below if you have any questions, put them in the right-hand discussion panel. What I probably wanna add here as well is please complete any fields that have been assigned to you. And if you have any changes you would like to make, feel free to edit the document directly. So very clear what is expected of this person. And I can attach this message to any invitation I send out on an NDA. And you can have multiple. So if you are sending out NDAs and sales agreements, you can always have these available to you. There's no limit to the amount of messages that you can have. So just a great idea to get those preemptively ready for when you start sending out contracts. So we also have your preferences. So I would suggest taking a couple of minutes just to set these up if you haven't already. Uh, but the first and one that I always encourage people to use is this receive weekly deadline reminders by email. So any date-based information that has an end date or a reoccurring date, you are going to be able to find that information in the deadlines page that I had showed to you, but you are also going to be able to get a individual email sent to you every Sunday at 5 p.m. PST. So that way when you log in on Monday, it's just, hey there, waiting in your inbox. But it shows you all of the upcoming deadlines for a particular amount of time. So I'm just pulling one up here so you can see what that looks like in my email. So we have all of our renewals, end dates, and then any other clauses. And then you could just hop into Concord and view there. But it does give you a really great idea of maybe where you want to focus your attention for the week. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cold season has been really just winning the battle that I have been having with it lately. So the default is to show things 180 days out. I keep mine a little bit shorter so that way I can get more regular emails because I clean this up pretty often, but you can set it up for whatever you think is going to benefit you from the most, excuse me, you will benefit from the most. The other option here is email notifications. So you have two options. Well, three, really. You can say, I do not want any email notifications whatsoever. Don't bother me with this information. You can also say, I want a recent activity digest for these actions. And what that is going to mean is that every time one of these actions has occurred, you will receive a singular email at the end of the day, every 24 hours, and it will detail everything that has happened within the last day. If you are more inclined to want a singular email for an action, you can receive an individual, act, excuse me, an individual email, which would mean as soon as a new version is created by a colleague or from an internal external guest, I want an individual email. Or if a message is posted, I want an individual email because I really wanna be able to stay on top of conversations. And then lastly, we have our integrations page. Uh, so we integrate natively with all of these options here, Salesforce, DocuSign, Google Drive, Dropbox, uh, these social media accounts. I don't think anybody really uses them, but maybe back in the day, folks used uh, social media to log into Concord. Uh, we also just recently added the opportunity to use webhooks so you can connect Concord with other platforms and kind of create an integration using our API. One thing that will be coming also at the end of April is a Zapier integration. So I'm not sure if anybody uses that platform, but it is pretty cool. It allows you to create integrations without having to touch the API. So if you're not a back-end, front-end developer such as myself, <laughs> I can't do any of that stuff. But I want to be notified via Slack anytime someone signs one of my documents, I can create that using Zapier. All right, so any questions just on personal settings?
All right, cool. So one thing I want to talk about here, this is our admin setting. So if you're not in the admin, you're not going to see it, but there are a few things that I want to review just because it is actually going to be applicable to all of us. And the first thing is users. So we have all been added as a user to Concord. That's why we're here today. And when you are added to Concord, you are assigned a permission or a role. So I mentioned earlier today that we have these three default roles, viewers, collaborators, and creators. So viewers can only view. Also for our admins, they're free users. So you could be pretty judicious and thoughtful about who you pay for to use Concord. So if you have folks on your team who really just need to have eyes on documents, but they don't need to make any edits, they don't need to touch anything, give them a viewer permission and save one of your paid licenses for somebody who needs to you know, create or doctor up documents. We also have collaborators so they can edit documents and then creators who can edit, create and sign. Now, if none of these work for you, that is okay because your admins can also create custom roles. So let's say that you have been given collaborator permissions, but you're frequently invited to sign documents. By default, collaborators cannot sign documents. So what your admin would want to do is just create a new role for you. And maybe they create roles based off of your role. So maybe they create a paralegal role, or maybe they create an executive role. So we'll use paralegal as the option here. My typing is really bad. I apologize. It's even worse than I have a class full of people. And then what your admin is able to do is come through and just give you the permissions that you need. So they could model it very closely after that default collaborator permission, but then maybe also give you the opportunity to sign documents. So if your permission isn't working, definitely just reach out to your admin. Admin, just be mindful that you can create very, very specific roles for specific teams or people. Now we also have teams. Teams again are an admin generated functionality, but even non-admins will be able to use Teams to share out documents. And a team is very similar to a group email. So when you email it at your company.com, it goes to all of your IT team members and one of them will pick up the ticket. This is very similar. So when you create a team with multiple different individuals, you are able to share a document out to that team and the document will go to all of these people. You're gonna see my face a lot because I use myself in the demos. Uh, yours will probably look a little bit more extensive when you create them, uh, but these are all fake, fake people, <laughs> surprise. So if you wanted to share a document out with the entire customer education team, you would be able to access this team when you share it out. So your admins will be able to create that. You will be able to take advantage of it. Now I want to talk about folders and tags. So let's start with tags. When you think of folders and tags, a lot of people are a little bit confused about their differentiation. So I've associated two words with these that have helped me quite a bit in my understanding. Folders are for access, tags are for awareness. So when you tag a document, you are using a keyword or keywords to group your documents together by commonality. So for every NDA that I send out, I am going to tag it with legal because I want my legal team to be able to come in and run a search off of these keywords and produce a list of all of the legal associated documents. I also want them to be able to run reports off of all of those documents. If I'm a sales team member and I wanna easily be able to track sales based on price, cost, I can create these tags kind of putting them into different buckets associated with the, the cost, with the contract, and then tag. So I can easily say, all right, let's see all of the contracts that brought in 100 to 150K within the last 30 days. So I like to think about them as digital post-it notes. If you were in a conference room and you had to find all of your contracts that you were kind of responsible for overseeing, you'd tag them with a pink sticky note with your department or your name or a cost. And then finding those documents later on to report off of, to take a look at, to be mindful of, would be really easy because you'd see that pink sticky note. Now, most of us aren't in the office anymore, so those sticky notes aren't gonna cut it for us. 
So admins create the tags and other individuals who have been given tag creation permissions can do so as well. But all collaborators and hire are able to add tags to the document. Now let's talk about folders. Folders are created by admins and folders are managed by admins. So we as collaborators or creators would not be able to just join a folder or search for a folder or have access to a folder without an admin sharing it to us directly. So if you were to log into your account and come into your documents and then look at your shared folders, I'm an admin on this account, so I have access to all folders. If you were to log in right now, you might not see any folders because your admins haven't created them yet, or you just haven't been shared to any. Typically, folders are organized by department or contract type. That is not what you are limited to organizing them by. It's whatever works best for your organization. But for the sake of the demo here, let's say that we are all in the finance department. So we have documents that the entire finance team needs to be aware of and needs to have eyes on. So our admins created a finance folder for us. And all of the documents that we need to have eyes on are going to be added to this folder. We will be able to see the documents added to the folder once they are signed. Folders are for templates and signed documents. So if I finish a document, it will be visibly available to all of the users that have access to this finance folder. Now, as I am saying this, you are probably thinking you have three drafts, two in signing and one in review. So what you said is a lie. <laughs> So the way that it works is if you are the creator of a document, and let's just open this lease agreement here. If you are creating the document, you will see it in the folder because you are the owner. Anybody else in the folder, it's not going to be available to until it is signed. They will be able to sign it once it's, excuse me, they'll be able to see it once it is executed. Why is it structured that way? We might be executing this commercial lease agreement, but I don't want all 15 of my colleagues working on this document, coming in and adding edits. That's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. So whomever I want to edit this document, I'm going to share it out to them directly. It can be colleagues, it can be external individuals. And then once it is signed, fully executed, ready to go, those that have access to the folder will be able to see it. If you are working on a full, uh, excuse me, if you are working on a document that exists in a folder, you'll be able to see it in the folder because you are the owner. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Cool. All right. I thought we'd get a little bit more questions there. This is great. You guys are making my job too easy on a Thursday morning. All right. So before we move on here, how is everybody feeling kind of just about setting things up, structure of documents? All right. Cool. So let's go ahead and we're going to start talking about creating documents and then I like to give us like a 15 minute break. Uh, probably around the 211 mark, which is so in like 20 minutes, I know we're all operating off of different time zones. Um, I'm on the East Coast I know a lot of you on the West Coast summer Midwest it's a nice little melting pot so that's pretty cool. All right, let's get into the exciting stuff then. <laughs> so let's actually start talking about creating new documents. So we have the opportunity here to draft and sign, store and track, and create a template. I'm going to start by drafting and signing. From here, you have three other options. You can say, I want to start from a template. I would like to upload a document, or I want to create a blank document. The first thing that I want to show you is starting from a template. Because if you have access to templates, use them. It is going to be 
such a time saver for you, especially if you're generating the same contract over and over and over again. If you have the opportunity to create templates, I highly, highly encourage you to do so, because not only is it going to save you time moving forward, it's going to help you guarantee compliance and it's going to make the lives of your team so much easier. So let's start with a template just to kind of see how that looks. And then we'll talk about creating templates as we start building out the documents. So let's use this sales contract here, and it's a template. I'm building off of it. We're creating the document. What you're immediately going to notice is the fields have already been built in for me. So all of the information that I need to collect, the text has already been drafted. So I can be sure that my team has drafted this to be compliant with our legal team and any other sort of privacy sales agreement requirements we are obligated to follow. So really all I have to do is fill in these placeholders here. And share it out to the appropriate person. Now you can also build in a lot more functionality into your templates, you can build in approvals, you can build in summary information, you have full authority as somebody creating the template to do that. But look how much faster it was for me to just get this sales contract started by building off of a template. If I start from scratch, I need to bring in all of these fields and all of this information. So it's always going to take just a little bit longer. So if you have templates, use them. <laughs> all right, let's talk about drafting and signing and the other options that we have available. So let's create a blank document. This information all exists in the contract summary. You can fill it out right out front. Or you can fill it out from the summary data here. So one of the first things that you're going to want to do is title the document and fill out the summary information. Now, this is a blank document, so I can essentially just use Concord as my word processor. I can type information in, I can go ahead and bold it, I can add specific text, I can add images, I can add grids. Now, this is also referred to as the live editor. So the live editor has a lot of functionality in terms of editing text, changing text style, we have a, a limited number of fonts, but you can change it. And you can also add in a larger number of field types. Now let's close this out and let's bring in a PDF because a PDF is not using the live editor. And we still have a lot of functionality, but editing is limited. When you bring in a PDF, it's essentially the equivalent of bringing in an image, right? So I can't edit this text, I can't change anything. What I can do is add in fields, but my fields are limited to text fields and signature fields. So I don't have those short answer, the paragraph, the smart fields, the radio buttons. Uh, it's, it's pretty simplified. We still have the summary information. We still have discussions, we still have our audit. We can still set up simple approvals and run our e-signature. But that direct editing and negotiation is going to be a little bit more limited than the live editor. Now we also have word mode. Um, I'm not a big fan of the name. I'll be honest about that uh, because it leads people to think that you're essentially just working in Microsoft Word while you're in Concord. Um, the intent here of word mode is formatting. So we have a lot of customers who just build out these gorgeous, beautiful contracts within Microsoft Word. And then when you bring those contracts into any third party platform, not even just Concord, they have a tendency to get skewed. So all of that gorgeous formatting and branded style text is gone. So what Word Mode does is keep your formatting identical to how it exists in Microsoft Word. Um, so if formatting is very important to you, this is a wonderful option you're still able to add in text fields and signature fields and take advantage of all of the other functionality here, but the editing of the text directly is limited. 
So if you did want to edit the text, you would have to download, edit in Word, re-upload, so on and so forth. The live editor is where we spend most of our time. That's where most of our customers get their work done. That's where I usually do my demos off of, because this is where all of that dynamic functionality actually comes into play. One quick thing I want to show you here on our Concord homepage is a template center. So if you are ever looking for a template to get started with, or a document to bring into Concord to play around in so you can, you know, kind of test the platform without using a real agreement. These are really great options. I use them all the time. I've also had folks come in and grab templates and actually, you know, bring them into their everyday workflows. So let's grab, let's find a good one. We will use digital marketing agreement. So it gives you a visual of what that's going to look like. And then we download the template, download, and then we're just going to bring it in. Now, when you bring in a Word document, you can again pick Word mode, what we should, which, which we just took a look at, <laughs> and then live document, which is what we're going to be working in today. So the live document is that live editor, but that's where we just get a lot of our functionality from. One quick call out that I wanna make here is, uh, have any of you joined the uh, bundle release training? So the, the UI change, I feel like I recognize a couple of your names, but I'm not sure if it's from that training or previous. We are running them multiple times a week, multiple times a day on some days. So I will call out that this is going to look a little bit different come the end of April, but the functionality is going to be the same. Um, if anybody's curious about the look, more than happy to show you at the end of this session today. Um, but if you do get any email notifications, uh, I know the marketing team is uh, really prepping folks to be excited and get ready for the UI change. It's going to look different. Functionality, that core functionality of Conquer will be the same. So everything that you're learning today will be applicable. Um, just want to make that call out in case anybody was concerned. Um, and I'd be happy to give you a quick little demo at the end of the session today, too, if anyone's interested. All right. So we have our document here. The first thing that you want to do is give it a title. Now, this is something that I was absolutely horrible at when I first started using Concord. So I ended up with about 50 documents all titled marketing agreement or sales agreement. And it was impossible to find the document that I was actually looking for. So we always suggest a very specific naming convention. I like to follow the format of digital. I like to follow the format of the type of agreement followed by the customer that I am working on this agreement with, followed by the date that we expect it to be signed. Pretty aggressive timeline considering the end of March is today. <laughs> so maybe we've changed that to April. Now you don't have to use this specific timeline, uh, excuse me, this specific title, but something of this nature is going to be very helpful for you. It's going to keep everybody on the same page and it's going to make everything look very neat, very clean, very organized. Also, this title gives you a ton of information right out front. I know what it is, who it's with, and when it was signed. Now, the second thing that you're always going to want to do is fill out this contract summary. This contract summary is available to any internal member shared to the document. Additionally, it is kept with the document as long as the document exists in Concord. So if you're using Concord five years from now and you have to look at a digital marketing agreement from the Maxwell Inc. in March 2020, you will have the agreement and you'll also have all of that additional information that's helpful to your company. So third party name. This, you'll remember, is one of the fields that is searchable by the navigation, excuse me, the search panel on our navigation page. Description, what is this company? What do they do? Who's their CEO? What information is helpful for our team to track? All of that information we're going to put in the description. 
This is also where we can enter tags. So let's say we anticipate this agreement to bring in 250K. We're gonna tag it as such. We can also link this to another document. So we could say this is a linked to, is amended by, is under the framework of, and maybe it's the Maxwell NDA that they had signed and we hit send. So now there's a link to this document in this contract. This again is only available to internal team members who have been shared to the document, but permissions are always gonna be respected. So what that means is if I share this document out to, we'll use Jason at the Phoenix org, there's my guy. If Jason is shared to this document here, which we have just done, they will be able to see that this agreement is linked to this NDA. If they have permission to this NDA, when they click it, they'll be taken to that document. If they don't have permission to this document, they'll be taken to a page that says, hey, you don't have permission to this document. It actually says it a bit more formally, but that's the gist. <laughs> So your permissions are always going to be respected, which is very important. We can also adjust where we want this to be stored. So if we have access to a specific folder and we want this digital marketing agreement to be available to the marketing team once it's signed, we're going to store it in the marketing team folder. We can also set our lifecycle information. So let's say that all of our marketing agreements are valid for a period of one year. We could also say until permanently unknown. You can change the time frame as well. And let's say it becomes effective on April 15th. We can also add a renewal period. So we can say, you know, when the contract ends for a period of one month and our notification of non-renewal is gonna be five days, very quick turnaround. We can save this here. All of this date-based information is going to drive our notices and all of those emails that we're going to be getting as well. Now, this down here is customizable. So what is this add field? These fields, the width, the description, the tags, they are right out of the box with the contract summary. But there's probably other information that you want to track as a company. Maybe it is company size of your customer. So we can see, you know, have they grown in five years? Should we adjust their pricing? You know, back in 2022, they had 150 employees. We can add another field. Maybe we want to track the phone number. So we can always get in touch with them. Yeah, we did five by five. So this is just additional information that you can track. I don't know why I bother fixing the spelling because it's usually worse the second time around. You can also add custom clauses. So you'll remember when I was talking about our deadlines page, I had showed you a monthly payment that was reminding me that we needed to collect. This is where we'd be able to set that up. So let's say that we agreed to do a digital marketing plan for the Maxwell Incorporation, but they didn't wanna pay it all at once. So we're saying not a problem, you can pay it monthly. So what we would say is, you know, Maxwell monthly plan, and we'll say, you know, 12,000 across one year. We can add our duration of frequency. So we're going to say it is a recurring event and it repeats every one month. And the reoccurrence starts at the start of the contract, which we've already identified up here. And it ends at the end of the contract, which is also identified up here. We can then, if there is a financial amount attached to it, there doesn't have to be, but it's an option. For us, it's necessary. We're gonna say to be paid, the amount is 1,000. We have all of these different currencies available. And then we can say before tax or all taxes are included, and we're gonna hit save. So now every month we're going to get that reminder, hey, we need to collect that $1,000 from the Maxwell Corporation for their digital marketing agreement. This information, You'll remember when we exported the line item information from our inbox, a lot of the fields were blank. That is because I did not fill out the summary information for a lot of my contracts that I'm just demoing. This information will all appear in that export. So that's even more information that you're able to provide to your colleagues outside of Concord. 
So it's not incredibly fun to fill in all of this information, but it is super helpful because it is indefinitely involved with this contract. So again, if we decide to do another agreement with the Maxwell Inc. in 2023, we know exactly why they got what they got. Additionally, maybe they got a discount because we forgot to return their email. So the CEO said, you know, give them a 10% discount. And maybe when they come back to us, they say, we want that same discount. We want to have that information here. So we can say, yeah, absolutely. Or sorry, can't do that. We've been very responsive this time around. But any details you can give is always going to be helpful. This information is not available to external parties. So when I ultimately share this out to the Maxwell Inc., they will not see the contract summary. Questions on importing, contract summary, all that good stuff. Cool. All right. Um, is now a good time for everybody to take a 15 minute break? I know it's early for some of you. I know it's also probably around lunchtime for some of you. And I know I've been talking at you guys for an hour. So let's go ahead and take a, a 15. We'll just come back. Um, let's just say 15 on the hour. Uh, so next hour 15 and we'll keep going. All right, I'll see everybody in a little bit over 15 minutes. <laughs>
All righty, folks. Well, welcome back. Uh, if you just want to give me a, a hands up or a back or just any indication that you are here. Perfect. Seeing some things come through. Appreciate that. All right, and let's do a quick little pulse check. How's everybody feeling? How's the pace of the class? How's content? Anything that I can be explaining a bit more clearly? Usually I give a disclaimer at the start of the session that I am a Boston based, born and raised. So I have a tendency to talk very quickly and I also just don't stop talking. So <laughs> you are more than welcome to call me out on that at any time. But the big goal here is that hopefully none of you knew that I was from Boston because I've spent years masking my terrible Boston accent. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you can pick up on it. Most people hear it when I say Concord. All right, well, let's keep going. And again, feel free to jump in, ask questions, unmute yourself, any I like to keep it conversational. Uh, we probably won't take the full three hours today, so we'll have plenty of time for conversations. I can show you the new UI coming at the end of April, um, and you know, just talk about any other Concord thoughts that you might have. All right. So what I'd like to start focusing on now is getting this document ready for agreement. So we filled out the summary information. We have shared it out to my internal colleagues. We've given it a title. What I want to do now is get this document prepped and ready for when I share it out to my customer. So one of the first things that I'm going to want to do is bring in fields for them to complete. I have two options when I share this out to the Maxwell company. I can allow them to only fill in fields that I have assigned to them, or I can give them full editing information. If I give them full editing permissions, excuse me, they can come in and doctor up the document as much as they want. If I just give them the opportunity to fill in the fields, they will only be able to fill in fields that have been assigned to them. So we really just want to start thinking about how much editing power we want this third party to have. So when we're starting to add fields in, we're going to go to our fields drop down and we have a couple of different options. We have signature fields, short answers, paragraph, radio buttons, check boxes and smart fields, which we Shannon, will talk about in depth in just a few minutes. We can't see your presentation. You can't see my presentation. That's because my screen is paused. I am so sorry. Can you see it now? <laughs> Sure can. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. I would have just kept going. So thanks for calling that out. Uh, my apologies. So I am just right here in this fields drop down. Uh, so we have our signature, short answer, paragraph, radio buttons, check boxes, and smart fields, which we'll talk about in depth in just a few. So what I'm going to do here is use a lot of the short answers. The other benefit to these templates that we grabbed from Concord is that they do highlight the locations in which fields should be inserted. If you don't have that call out text or that placeholder text, it's absolutely fine. What you're going to notice is as soon as we add the field here, it's going to go wherever your cursor was last left, but you can also just drag and drop it into the appropriate location. So it's very simple to be able to move it around. I'm just going to add a couple of these in here. We'll do client website address and you get the idea here now as we're adding in these fields you also have opportunities to assign as well so i'm going to come back into field we'll use paragraph for this option and we'll use a placeholder so this is key words for search engine optimization campaign and i can make it required Required means that somebody is required to fill it out pre-signature. And I can also say I want it to be fillable by somebody from my company, so someone internally that has been invited to the document. An external guest, which means somebody invited to the document that doesn't work for my company, and then anyone 
Anyone means we don't care who fills out this field, we just need to get it filled out. The last option would be a signer. So once you have signatories assigned to the document, you can assign fields to them specifically. So I'm going to set it as anyone for right now, but once we establish some of our signatories, I'm going to come back in and assign those fields so you can see what that looks like. Now, I'm not going to go through and do this entire placeholder just in the essence of time here, but I am going to add a smart field because there's some cool things that we can do with it later. So smart fields are just predefined fields that your admins create for you. So they're a lot faster to add because they've already been established with a placeholder, they've already been established with a type, and you don't have to create them from scratch. So I'm going to bring in this actual cost. And we'll just say, you know, it's completable by anybody. And I'm going to drag it here. And I'm going to input it one more time. So smart field, actual cost. Now, a question we get pretty regularly is we have the signature field. So I could say Shannon is required to sign this portion. Maxwell is going to be required to sign this portion. But a lot of times folks are interested in a initials field. So we don't have a field titled initials, but we do have short answer. So if you did want to do that, we could just say, you know, initials and then just drag it to the appropriate location. So that is an option as well. Now, one of the benefits to the smart fields is that they're dynamic. So they're already created for us, but additionally, they are going to be dynamic if you have multiple smart fields of the same name in your document. So watch what happens when I fill out actual cost. It's input in here, but it's also going to carry to other smart fields of the same name. So when you do have fields that are repeated throughout a document, it can be really frustrating for your contract invitees to fill that information out over and over again, such as company name, date, employee name, actual costs as we've just added, maybe even initials. So these smart fields will combat that for us. So a great option for smart fields might be customer initials. So all of the locations in which you want them to initial, they fill it out once, it's automatically updated to all the other smart fields of the same name. Uh, if you want the agreement to be on a letterhead, how do you place a header footer on the template? I do not know if we have great capability for that. Um, so, let me actually see if any of the onboarding managers have some suggestions for that. I'll reach out to them. I assume that if you import it from a Word document with the letterhead included, it would be fine. Um, but I've actually never tried. So let me put a pin in that question and let me see if I can get any suggestions from uh, some onboarding managers who might have run into that with other customers. Uh, the other option that I could just kind of think of without, you know, trying to get creative is you can add an image. So if you wanted to bring in a logo or that letterhead, let's see if I have any images. I should probably have some screenshots somewhere. Um, Nothing good. Oh, excuse me. Just one second, folks. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, but you would be able to add an image to the top. So here's a screenshot here. And then we would probably, of course, just want to resize and format it to the appropriate location. Um, but again, let me see if I can find some other creative options as well. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I thought I had gotten all of them out. Excellent. Any, any questions just about inserting fields, smart fields? Excellent. So we've input these fields. I think I'm ready to share this out with my third party.
So I'm going to select share. In case anybody's wondering why this enter tags field is here, admins have the opportunity to enable a setting that requires tagging of documents. So what they're able to do is say, I am going to make it a requirement to add a tag to a document. You won't be able to save the document or close the document out until you've added a tag, or you can remind your users to add tags. So that's what I have enabled here. So this is just a reminder when I go to share the document, save the document or close the document, it's reminding me to add tags. I don't have the requirement for tags, but I do have the reminder. So if you do want to rely pretty heavily on tagging for reporting, for filtering, this is a really great option. So I'm gonna share this out to Maxwell. Maxwell. Hey, yes. It's, it's Leanne. Um, Leanne. I just wanted to ask, uh, when you're done with this, can you demonstrate how to remove that reminder in oh, settings? Yes. yes, absolutely. I'll actually, while we're talking about it, let's just, let's just do it. Thanks. So we're going to invite Maxwell here and I'm going to give them full editor permissions because I want them to actually come in and make changes, negotiate with me. I want to avoid extra meetings, extra phone calls. So I'm going to allow them to do all of this directly in the document. So we're going to go ahead and hit send. And then I'm quickly going to make sure my document is saved. Looks like it is. And then let's just talk about that reminder for tagging. Because if it's enabled and you don't want it enabled, it can be very annoying, <laughs> which I'm sure is what you might be running into. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to come into my settings here. I know I always turn it on when I give demos and then I forget to turn it off. So if you are an admin, you're going to come into your company settings and then select preferences. And then down towards the very bottom, you have document tagging, which you can remind users to add to their documents, which is what I have enabled. And then mandatory tagging, which would prevent your users from leaving the document or sharing the document until a tag is added. So if you want to take it off, you're just going to uncheck those boxes and you're good to go. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Great question. So let's hop back into the digital marketing agreement here. And one thing I want to mention is that uh, both Jason and Maxwell are actually just demo accounts. So they haven't accepted their invitation yet. So what that means is they're pending, essentially. So they have received an email to their inbox. If you are an external member without an account, you're going to click a link and you're going to be brought to this document directly. External invitees do not have to create an account. They do not have to pay to use Concord. All they have to do is click a link and they will be brought here to start editing or filling in fields, whatever permission it is that you gave them. If you're inviting an internal team member, they'll be taken to their account, asked to log in, and then taken to this page. So it's a very quick process, very user friendly for external invitees. We don't want them to have to spend a lot of time creating an account or doing anything, so they're brought right here. Now, if let's say one of them comes back to you and says, hey, I didn't get that invitation, could have ended up in their spam, uh, but most likely maybe they just didn't see it, they deleted it without reading it, you can always resend that invitation. So you can send that invite as many times as you need. And once they accept that invitation, you're going to see this little green envelope disappear. We won't see it today just because these are fake people, uh, but you will see that once somebody actually accepts the invitation. But let's say here, for the sake of the demo here, that I am now logged in, I am Maxwell, I am that third party, I take a look at this agreement, I have been given full editor permission, so I am ready to go. Theoretically, there is nothing stopping me from coming in here and just going crazy. I could come in and edit text, I could come in and add text, I have that editor permission. Now, for me, as somebody who is owning this document, creating this document, that's not ideal. Is it very likely that a customer would do this? No, but to really drive the point home, we're going to talk about it as if they would. So that's great. There's three of us. Managing edits from one person isn't going to be too much of a hassle, but let's say that Maxwell wanted to bring in multiple people from his company. It can be a bit of a challenge to manage that many people editing one document. So there are a couple of ways that you can enable a bit more control over their edits while still giving them that full permission. Okay. Can we edit the document uh, when, when it is in public version? 
I'm sorry. When I uh, just, I think it cut out before you you finished the question. You mind just saying that again? Can we edit the document when uh, it is in public version? Yes, you can edit the document when it's in public version. Um, we'll actually talk about public versions and internal versions in just one second. Because that's a really great question. Awesome. All right. So let's say that Maxwell does come in and make edits. Anytime a document is saved, a new version is created. So if they did absolutely just make an astronomical amount of changes that we were not comfortable with, we can view version history. So I can say, Ooh, I'm not a big fan of the changes they made. I'm going to come back to the previous version. I can export it to download, or I can restore this version. Now, I'm not going to want to have to do that for every single edit that is made. So what I'm going to do instead, and actually, I think I went back one too many versions. So give me one second. Because I do want to make sure we still have those fields in there. There we go. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go ahead and turn on track changes. So when I turn on track changes, what's going to happen is everybody who has editing permission, editing permission can still come in and edit. But what we're going to notice is there's a visual indication that an edit has been made. But internal creators, so myself and internal collaborators, Jason, my colleague, can come in and say, nope, we don't like that change. Or actually, that makes a lot of sense. Let's go ahead and approve it. So we're still allowing our external invitees to edit, make those changes, negotiate with us. But at the end of the day, we still have that final say. So I always suggest turning that on just so you have kind of complete control over the edits, but still give your external invitees that flexibility. Now, a great question was just asked about editing in public version versus internal version. So the minute that you create a document, it's an internal version. The moment that you share it out to an external invitee, it becomes public. Now, you do have the opportunity to switch back to an internal version. Why would I want to do that? And what would happen if I did? Let's say that Jason, my colleague, and myself are going through this contract, and we realize that there are quite a few larger edits that need to be made that we don't want Maxwell to interrupt. What I'm going to do is switch to an internal version. When I create an internal version, the last public version will still be available for Maxwell to view. It will be frozen for edits, but they will still be able to view that document. They can ask questions in the discussion panel, but they can't make edits. What this allows me and my colleague to do is edit the document uninterrupted. So we can make those big changes that we just realized without the interruptions of an external party. So we would come in, we would make those changes, say, whoops, we need to get rid of this. Maybe we wanted to add an additional bullet point. Maybe we needed to add an additional paragraph. And again, we just didn't want that process interrupted or edited as we were editing. So we make all of those changes while it's frozen to Maxwell. And then when we have made those changes that we're comfortable with, got the document to the place we need it to be, we're going to publish it. Once we publish it, it then becomes a public version again. Maxwell's full editing rights are restored. <laughs> Excuse me just one second. Sorry about that. So essentially, it freezes the document to a view-only version for external parties, so you can collaborate internally and then make it public again. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Just want to make sure I, I understood it correctly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, that was something that I totally forgot to bring up, so I appreciate you making that call out. All right, excellent. So let's come back into editing, and I just want to go over a couple of other ways that we can dynamically work with our internal and external invitees. So we can, of course, edit the document directly. We can add fields to the document directly. We can also add comments and hold discussions. So when I add a comment, I'm essentially just adding information or context to a very specific line item of text. 
So what I might say here is, you know, this is unclear. Can we edit? Now you have two audiences, public and internal. Public means once I post this comment, every single person shared to this document can view that comment. If it is internal, it is only going to be visible to myself and internal colleagues. So for me, that would be Jason and Maxwell. One thing that I want to make very clear is that once you post a comment, the audience cannot be changed and the text cannot be changed. So what I always say is just be very thoughtful about your comments. So for example, if I came in here and said, Shannon hasn't edited this, she's moving so slow. Not that anybody would say anything of this nature in a legally binding document, but just to really drive the point home, if it's public, hmm, screenshot this, looks like a little bug. Sorry about that. They knew I shouldn't have said something mean about Shannon. <laughs> so she's moving so slow. Once it's public, I can resolve the comment so it's hidden, but it's always going to exist in the audit trail. So the audit trail is available to all invitees. So the audit trail consists of important actions that have been taken on the document. The comments consist of all of the resolved comments that have taken place within the document. Now it's very intentional that we can't edit the comments because it's meant to serve as a benefit to us. So for example, if we said, something important regarding this sentence you know this will be changed on january 3rd or what have you it's going to be kept so if our client comes back to us and says you know what actually you never told us about that we can say oh but we did we have this public comment in our comments audit trail so it's keeping track of everything so what I suggest, and probably what I would suggest all of you tell your team members as well, is just make sure that your team is very aware of the audience and the fact that it cannot be removed. The same information is going to fall under your discussion panel as well. Now, I like to use comments for specific uh, questions, thoughts related to specific lines in the text. Discussions, I suggest, is more of an overarching thought. So for example, what you might want to say is, hey, we're trying to get this wrapped up by Friday, end of day. Finalize all edits by Friday, end of day. Then we're going to send it out for signature. If this is public, there's going to be an email sent to all invited guests. So it's going to keep everybody on the same page. This is very helpful because although you and I might log into Concord regularly, you're external guests might not. They might click into it, make their edits, and then kind of forget about it, right? They have a lot of other things going on. But when I say, you know, kindly finalize your edits, we're going to switch over to signature by Friday, that message is going to be sent to all of us so we're all on the same page. It'll include a link back to the document so they can come in and pick up right where they left off. As an internal user, you will receive those messages as well if you keep your message posted, email or activity digest enabled. I do suggest keeping this as an individual email because if somebody is putting information into the discussion panel, it's usually of fair importance. Um, and if you don't mind just giving me one quick second, I'm just gonna pass along that little pop-up modal, excuse me, pop-up modal I received about um, the commenting because I, just want folks to be aware of that in case other folks are experiencing it too. So just give me two seconds. Sorry about that. All right, thanks folks, sorry. Could just be an issue in my account. I'm working in my, my demo account, but figured I'd pass it along just in case. All right, let's hop back into our document here. Digital marketing agreement. 
finalize edits. Now we have really edited the document. We've added the appropriate fields. We've worked pretty closely with our internal and external collaborators. Do we have any questions in regards to how we can dynamically negotiate on this contract, internally or externally? And I'm just gonna go ahead and add a couple of fields back into the document because when I reverted to a previous version, I got rid of them. All right, no questions? Cool. So what we're gonna close out with is approval workflows and e-signature. Now, you might not need to use approval workflows, but it is an option that you have available. So what I'm gonna do here is add in an approval workflow. And there are gonna be two types that you have access to. The first of which is a company approval, the second of which is a custom approval. Company approvals are admin generated and they're very similar to smart fields in the sense that they are pre-generated, already built out. All you need to do is attach it to your document. Now, what you're gonna notice is they have included in these company approvals, a very descriptive title, a very descriptive descriptive text. And then I am also able to see who this is assigned to. So who is responsible for actually approving the document? So it's a very clear who I should be selecting or which option I should be selecting for this agreement. But if you look, some of these have this descriptive text of required for all consulting contracts, required for all lease agreements. Now, when we're sending out multiple agreements a day, there's a very good chance that I would forget to add that approval meaning that we'd move forward with this agreement, we'd execute it fully without getting the needed approval for a consulting contract. So luckily I am remembering to add it here, but can anybody think of something that we could do to make sure that this approval was attached to all digital marketing agreements? I mentioned it earlier today. So if you can't remember, that's absolutely fine, but any thoughts? Yeah, we could certainly add a tag to remind folks. We could certainly add information in the discussion panel, but you can also add approvals to templates. So if I wanted to, I could turn this digital marking agreement into a template and include the approval. So that way, anytime somebody had a digital marketing agreement to use, they would be able to immediately have access to this approval, go ahead and request it and not have to worry about adding it themselves. So kind of another added benefit to templates. Uh, that was a bit of a tricky question because I haven't shown you how to build out templates, um, but definitely nice to start thinking about. So what we would wanna do is once we have the document where we feel it's ready for internal approval, we'd go ahead and request. And a request, uh, excuse me, a request would then be sent to all of the approvers and if you are an approver, you can approve or reject it directly from the page. Now we would just be waiting for the second approver, if there was a second step, the entire workflow to be completed. Now I'm gonna get rid of this one because the other option that we have here is to include a custom approval. So the custom approvals can be set up very similarly to your company approvals. 
in the sense that we can include a mandatory step, which means no matter what happens with this agreement, we absolutely 110% have to get approval from Jason. And then we're done. We add save, there it is, we request, we wait for Jason to approve. The other option we have is a conditional custom approval. So you can do mandatory and conditional, you can just do conditional, you can create pretty extensive workflows. But the way that conditional workflows work is based off of a smart field. So this allows you to be a little bit more sparing when it comes to requesting approvals from specific individuals. So for this marketing agreement, let's say that our CEO really only wants to be looped in if it's over a specific cost because then they're going to want to approve it. They're going to want to be involved, maybe build a relationship with the Maxwell company if they're spending quite a bit of money with us. So what I'm going to do here is say, if the actual cost, and I'm going to say is greater than or equal to, and we'll say 15K, then we need to get approval from our CEO. So let's take away this mandatory step and just keep the conditional and hit save. So as we see it now, we don't have any helper text saying, hey, we need to get an approval. We're good to go. But when I come in and add information into that specific smart field and hit save, it's going to immediately trigger, hey, now that this is over a specific amount, now that that condition has been met, we do need to request an approval. So we're just going to go ahead and hit request and then wait for our CEO to come and view this information. Now, one thing I want to also mention is that if somebody is included in an approval, they do have to be invited to the document. So I have a couple of different Jasons included in my demo account. We have a Jason that works for me and then another Jason. So the Jason that I added to the approval was not shared to the document. So what does that mean? That means that they are not added to the document by me, but they will be added to the document automatically when I request their information. So if I forget essentially to add the approver to the document, once I hit request, Concord is going to send that invitation to them. That way they have access to the document. Excuse me, just one moment. Sorry about that folks, trying to avoid uh, sneezing and coughing into the microphone. <laughs> Allergies, cold season, I don't know what it is, but it's winning. Sorry about that folks. So even if you do forget to invite somebody that is added to this document via approval, via e-signature, Concord will take it upon itself to invite them. Questions on approvals. Approvals can be auto. Um, can they be auto requested? Sorry, do you mean can they be auto requested without having to click this button here? Yeah. Um, the initial approval does have to be requested, but if you have an approval workflow that has multiple steps, let me find one here. So this one here has multiple steps. You can say automatically notify next approvers when a step is complete. So what that would mean is I have to request that first step, but then once that first step is completed, it will automatically kick out a request to the second step and then the third step and then the fourth step. But that initial first step does always have to be manually requested. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great question.
Excellent. All right. Well, let's talk about e-signature. Um, any questions with anything that we have talked about up until this point? Can we uh, change the end user uh, signing authority name after sending the uh, document for signature? Uh, I'm sorry, do you mind just asking that one more time? Is there option to change the opposite party's uh, sign uh, signing authority name? Yes, yes, yep. Um, you can edit signatories. So let's actually go through that workflow right now. So when you're ready to request signatures, we of course need to have signers assigned to the document. You can configure your signers at any time. When you're yes. configuring your signers, we're not requesting signature. We're essentially just saying, eventually when we request signatures, it's gonna be you folks who are required to sign. So let's add myself as a signatory and let's add Maxwell as a signatory. And ultimately, when we move forward with signature, it will be the two of us. Now, currently, there are going to be three things that will bar us from requesting signature. So you'll see here, well, I'm ready to sign. Why can't I request those signatures? The first one is if you have any unmet approvals. So if you have any outstanding approvals that haven't been completed, you will not be able to sign the document. The second thing that would bar us from moving forward with e-signature is if we had any sort of required field that had not been completed. So if any of my fields were required, we would have to make sure that information was completed prior to moving forward with e-signature. The final option that would bar us from e-signature would be if we had any unresolved edits because we have track changes enabled. So when you have track changes enabled, if an edit has been made and we haven't either accepted it or rejected it, we will not be able to move forward with e-signature. So we wanna make sure those three things are completed first. One other call out that I wanna make because we just recently assigned signatories is that if we wanted it to be fillable by a specific person, we could assign it to a signer which would mean only I can fill this out. Because we also have signatories enabled, we can also add signature fields. And I'm gonna say, I sign here, and maybe Maxwell signs here. As well as that signature block down at the bottom. So let me go ahead and fill in that required field. And I'm gonna just take this approval workflow away because again, this isn't a real person. So we would be waiting for a pretty long time to get that approval completed. And then let's move forward with signature. So I'm gonna request signature. Our editing will be locked. So we are no longer able to edit the document as we are moving forward with e-signature. So I'm able to sign the document. I can either type it in, or draw it in, whatever you like better. Both are legally binding. But let's say we requested signatures, but ooh, accidentally we forgot to make a particular edit that we want to change. We can return to review up until a signature has been added. So when we request signatures, it's locked. We're in signing mode. We can say, I want to return to review to edit the document. All we would need to do to get the signatures back would be to request signatures again. So you can do that as many times as you need prior to signing. Additionally, if you want to change who has been assigned as a signatory, you can come back into your signer, excuse me, your signer panel, and we can remove the signer, we can add another signer, or we can change the signer. So I can say instead of Maxwell, it's going to be. Jason. Now let's say we have been working very closely with Maxwell from the Maxwell Inc, but it's actually going to be the director of finance who signs for them. What Maxwell would be able to do is come into the signature dropdown and delegate their signature. So if Maxwell instead wants 
you know, VP of finance to sign. What's going to happen, again, pardon the typing, is when he hits enter, all of his assigned fields will now be assigned to the VP at Maxwell.com. Any signing locations will be assigned to that person, and Maxwell will no longer be added as a signatory. He'll still be added as an editor, collaborator on the document, but not as a signatory. So any assigned signatory can delegate their signature if they need to. Internal users, I could delegate my signature. External signatories, they could delegate their signature. So let's go through the process of signing the document. So I'm going to select sign. And I'm going to just clear this, and we're going to draw it out again. When you invite someone to sign the document, their email will be auto-populated because that's how you have invited them. They will be required to input their name. Mine has already been captured because I use this platform regularly. And they have the opportunity to include their job title as well. So once you input that information once, it's indefinitely captured. And once you sign, the next time you sign a document, if you are invited to sign another document in Concord, your email will automatically be associated with your name and your job title. So you'll probably see yours already auto-populated. Your customers will have to add their name. That's required. And if they want to add their job title, they can. The next time they sign with you, this will automatically populate because it's associated with their email address. So let's go ahead and hit sign. We'll see it down at the bottom here. And then in any location where we had a signature field, we'll see it as well. So now we're just waiting on Maxwell to execute the agreement. If for whatever reason I signed, but the edit had to be made, we can't return to review. What we would have to do is cancel all signatures. So we'd cancel all signatures, make the edits, and then we would require everyone to sign again. So we want to avoid that if we can. Now, we know Maxwell is not a real person, uh, so I'm not going to make you wait for that signature to come through. So what I am going to do is just finalize the document because I want to show you a couple of things that you can do once a document has been fully executed. So when you do finalize a document, if all of the signatures haven't been obtained, any signature that is missing is essentially going to be taken off of the document. So again, this would not be a typical occurrence. I just want to show you a couple of things that you can do once a document is fully signed. So we're going to finalize. Can't be undone. Again, very rare that you would want to do this, but I want to show you a couple of additional options. So once a document is finally signed, of course, it will be listed as signed, but you can also export a signature certificate. So this is a, a new feature that's recently been added. Your e-signature is legally binding, so you don't need this signature certificate. It is additional information in regards to e-signature compliance. So if somebody is asking for additional information, you can provide them with this. And it's going to show you the document information, the audit trail, the number of signatures that have been added, and who has been signing the document. So it's, again, just additional information for compliance. This is not what makes your e-signature legally binding. Your e-signature is legally binding when you sign it. This is just kind of added benefit, added additional information. And what's really great about this, because I know a couple of you have mentioned you've been using Concord for a while, even though it is a new feature, any document that has been signed within Concord will be able to produce that signature certificate. So even if it was a document signed two years ago, if it was signed in Concord, you can export. Now, two final things that I wanna show you are just template creations and storing previously signed documents. So there are two ways to create templates. One, if you have a really great document, right? You have fields already built in, the text is great. You can say file, copy as a template. Just keep in mind that any information you have in the template or the initial document will be brought over into the template. So if I had summary information, if I had information in the discussion panel, if I had approvals, it would all be carried over. 
So anything that might be specific to a customer, you wanna just make sure it's removed before you save it as a template. The other option would of course be to just create a template from scratch. So we upload one of our files, and then we'd go through the same process that we went through today. We'd add our fields, we'd edit the text, maybe we add in an approval. And I always like to give it a standardized naming convention to make it easier for my team. So I would say, you know, this is a sales contract. When you use the template, you are gonna put in our customer name, and then you're gonna put in the date. So adding those little placeholders just to make sure they maintain that naming convention that we have structured. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share this template in my sales folder because you remember that folders are for signed agreements and templates. So anybody that has access to that sales folder will have access to all of the signed sales agreements, but additionally, when they start from a template, once that document is created, all of their information will automatically be stored in that sales agreement. So once it's signed, folks will have access to it again there as well. Now, lastly, Concord also serves as a repository. I mentioned that there's no limit to the number of documents that you can store. So if you have documents that were signed outside of Concord, you can bring them in. So instead of frantically searching around the office or in multiple people's desktops or emails or Google drives for a specific document, you can bring everything into Concord and it will become searchable and it will be stored in a single source of truth. So to upload a previously signed document, you browse, <clears throat> you'd bring it in, create the document. Now we can't edit the document, right? Because it's already been signed. So we can't edit a document post signature. We could export it and download it if we wanted to. And we can fill out the summary information. So for those of you that have just started using Concord, you probably have quite a few documents that are still active outside of Concord. What you can do is bring them in. So let's just say this is a sales contract. You signed it outside of Concord with the Maxwell Incorporation, and maybe you signed it in January. So it's still active. We want to start getting reminders on that. So let's go ahead and add that life cycle information. We'll say it was signed January 1st. It's going to be active for a period of one year. It became effective on the same date we signed it. We can add our renewal periods. And then now, even though we didn't complete this document in the Concord platform, we can still take advantage of that automation functionality. So definitely, if you have the opportunity to bring in documents that were executed outside of Concord, definitely take advantage of it because they become searchable by title and third party. And you can use all that automation feature. Now, this is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, can you show once again this? Uh... Adding the dates now. Adding the life cycle information? Yeah, life cycle, yeah. Please. Absolutely. So in your summary panel, let's just bring in a new document so we can do it from scratch. So all of that information exists under your summary, under life cycle. So you can set life cycle. You'd add when this contract was signed. You can say how long it's active for. And then if it becomes effective on a specific date, you can add that information as well. And then you can also come in and add your renewal periods as well, as well as the notification of non-renewal. And then all of this information is gonna be what drives your deadline reminders, as well as all of the information that exists on your deadline page. Now, the last thing that I'm going to show you here is it is an admin feature. So if you're an admin, I would encourage you to use it. If you are not an admin, I would encourage your admins to take advantage of it. 
But when you come into your settings, admins can do a bulk upload. So if you have, let's grab a folder here. If you have a folder of all of your sales agreements from the last five years, what you're able to do is just zip that file. I think it went over to a different screen. Yeah, not a problem. Have a great day. Yeah, if you have to jump up, not a problem at all. So here's our zipped file. What I would then be able to do is do a bulk upload of my sales agreements. I'm going to add it to my sales folder and I'm going to tag it with sales. And then all of those legacy documents will now be imported into Concord. So it is an admin feature, uh, but I would definitely encourage your admins to use it. And if you are an admin, I would definitely encourage you to go ahead and take advantage of it. All right, well, I've been talking to you guys for a little bit over two hours here. So I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, and if you do not have questions before you hop off, I do just have a quick little feedback form for you. We always wanna make sure that we have the appropriate information, trainings that you're interested in, uh, you know, any feedback that you have for me, we take it very seriously. So if you don't mind just taking a quick second to fill it out, it would certainly mean a lot to us, certainly mean a lot to me. Um, if you do have to hop out, thank you again so much for joining. I know it's really challenging to give up two hours of your day, uh, busy days to, to be here. So I really appreciate you trusting me with that time. Um, if you have to hop off again, thank you so much. Hopefully we'll cross paths again soon. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. I am happy to answer any and all. Um, oh, and in regards to that, um, uh, excuse me, that letterhead for the document, um, the, the best way to do it, I did double check, would be to upload the document with the letterhead on it or to bring it in through an image as we had done in the session today. Uh, before going last question. Sure. Uh, every uh, every Saturday, Sunday, we'll be getting notification from Concord saying that these are the contracts ending. Okay. And uh, I see that a lot of uh, documents, it is not relevant to the uh, expiry also we are getting notification what would be the issue uh why might one of your colleagues not be receiving the deadline reminder uh, we are uh, getting reminded for a few of the documents reminder is not needed but those documents we are getting reminded that those are also added into the list um so any date-based information is going to be included in the deadline email. Um, so you could disable the email if you didn't want to receive it, um, but it, there wouldn't be a way to weed out contracts from the deadline reminder email because all of the deadlines included within your Concord account would, would be looped into that email. Any other questions that I can answer for you folks? All right, well, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Thank you again so much for joining and I'll make sure to get this recording out to all of you within the next day. Thank you very much, Shannon. Have a good Thank one, folks. Know. Thanks for joining. Take care.